welcome back to another episode of Awkward Insurance. Only this episode marks the first episode of season two. Our first season was a little sporadic, a bit chaotic, and generally had no direction, much like life itself. But during season two, we hope to bring you just a little bit more organized thought process, but there's no guarantees. I know I have truly enjoyed learning through the process of the first season, and we'd really love to hear your thoughts on any of the past episodes and any future episodes or any ideas you may have. Maybe you would like to be a guest and speak about something that is on your mind and that impacts your daily work life in the insurance industry. So just send us an email at podcast at SCIC.com because it's the only way we're going to know if we're annoying you or connecting with you. So let's get started. In season one, you heard a lot of me. In this season, I am super pumped and already have goosebumps as I'm talking to have Kat Ferris with me as a co-host. Woo! Woo, woo. So happy to be here. <laughs> I know. I'm happy to have you too. You see, I see insurance through rose-colored personal lines glasses, and Kat is going to help expand our horizons. So welcome to Awkward Insurance as a co-host, Kat. Thank you, Dustin. And as a former underwriter, I am happy to rip those rose-colored glasses right off your face (laughs) and give you a hard dose of reality. (laughs) Now, I love going back and forth with my underwriters. Uh, Well, honestly, to be perfectly honest with you. My underwriters got used to me front-end underwriting, so they generally knew that if I was calling them, then I had good reason to, mm-hmm. and there wasn't a lot of argument that went back and forth. But every once in a while, we got in the weeds, and I was like, all right, I'm just ready for you to accept this business because you're going to yeah. accept it in the end. So just <laughs> Well, you were definitely my favorite kind of agent because there were always those agents that I knew they had done their due diligence before sending stuff my way. And it was always going to be a learning opportunity for me. Right. Well, I might have been an underwriter's favorite type of agent, but I definitely (laughs) wasn't my office's favorite type of agent because I was constantly like, no, you can't submit that to that care. And they're like, well, there are loopholes and gray areas. I'm like, okay, but this isn't going to work. You can't put an ambulance bay in a house. That's not how this works. (laughs) (laughs) So we've already had Kat on a couple of episodes. There is episode nine from our first season called Educate Yourself, Different Paths to Success, where we highlight that I have had a formal college education and Kat has had what we referred to as street cred education, otherwise known as industry education that we here at the National Alliance provide to all of our professional designees. Yet we both arrived at the same destination with the National Alliance. So we were just highlighting how there are different paths to get to the same point and even higher points. That was a really fun episode, Kat. What did you think about that episode? Was it fun for you? It was a lot of fun for me. And I think especially as someone who didn't get to go through the four-year college program early on in my career, I almost had felt like I had to hide that. It felt like there was almost some shame because I didn't get to go to a typical college. But now being in a role where I get to embrace that uh, alternative educational path and it's celebrated because, yeah, we are sitting at the same table. So that was such a huge moment for me. Yeah. You said something about shame for not going to college. I often feel shame for the way I attended college because my, you know, some of my degrees make no sense to what I'm actually doing which is very typical of college degrees. I hear (laughs) that a lot of people earn a degree in something and then what they actually end up in as a profession has nothing to do with their college degree. Mm -hmm. The second episode that Kat was a part of was called Rolling With My Homies. It was episode 11. It's one of the ones towards the end of the season where all of us ADs just got together and mingled for your listening pleasure. And we learned that Kat can rap. (laughs) I can, but very specifically, only nerd rap. Only nerd rap. What (laughs) movie was it from again? Is this something like High School Musical or something? No, it was from (laughs) Mean Girls, which you still have to see. So if anybody hasn't yet, before you listen to the Rolling With My Homies episode, watch Mean Girls, and then you can hear me do my sick Kevin Napore Mathletes rap. Kevin Napore Mathletes rap. I'm writing it down so that I don't forget because I forget everything. So <laughs> let's get to know Kat just a little bit more since she is going to be a regular co-host from this point forward. Kat, give us the skinny on everything we need to know so that the listeners can adore you as much as I do. Ooh, that's a tall order. You know, I think it's kind of ironic that you said that with season two, we're going to have a little bit of an organized thought process because um, 
I mean, I don't want to steal your thunder. Do you want to talk about it? Okay. (laughs) I didn't say it was a guarantee. As a matter of fact, I said it's it's not a guarantee because (laughs) organized thought process and me aren't usually synonymous. (laughs) Well, one of the things that, you know, I think you and I have learned from working together is just that how we bring so many differences to the table. You've got that agency background, a different educational background. I come from the underwriting side with with major carriers and MGAs with a commercial background. But, you know, our brains work differently as well. And so one of the things that we really want to focus on in season two is looking at how the insurance industry is so welcoming of people with different diverse cognitive skills. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so no matter if you are an introvert, an extrovert, you like to work one way versus the other, there is a role in the industry that can work for you. (laughs) Absolutely. You know, one of the things here that listeners may not realize is for this podcast, we tend to, uh, we say anything awkward plus because having relationships is awkward. Even developing a relationship with you has been a little awkward. (laughs) You know, for the awkward stuff, what our listeners may or may not realize is that we, so we talk about the awkward stuff in the insurance industry and developing those relationships, but we also try to keep a focus on account managers and uh, those who want to make something different of their careers rather than just being an account manager, because sometimes account managers get stuck in that role and they don't realize that there's more for them. But not only that, we've got an audience of students that we want to try and speak to as well. The National Alliance has programs for the CISR high school program and the university associate program, which is the CIC and the CRMs. And we want to speak to them about everything that is awesome about the insurance industry and everything that is awkward about the insurance industry. Because, yeah, okay, so my oldest child is going into middle school. And I don't know if you remember middle school or not, but I remember middle school and I've got pictures to prove just how awkward that moment in my life was. <laughs> I'm trying to block it out. You know, I'm trying to suppress all of those middle school memories, bury them deep to where the therapist can't even get through them. They were awful. <laughs> right. But one thing that they start to think about at that age is going to college or just little hints of what am I going to be when I grow up? Well, as you're in high school and even in college, you've got even bigger hints about that. And you're like, okay, well, this is the next step. I've actually got to figure out how to do this adulting thing. And the industry, the insurance industry is a great place to learn how to do the adulting thing. So I really want to focus in on that a little bit more this season. And I think that's one of the things that our next few episodes that we wanted to focus on. And what did you call it? The different cognitive abilities? Diverse cognitive abilities. Diverse cognitive abilities Mm -hmm. that we can speak about and just how you can use your diverse cognitive abilities to your advantage in this amazingly flexible insurance industry for so many different types of job roles that are available. You know, like producers. Yeah. If I kind of think of this in the high school way, producers are like the cheerleaders of of the insurance industry. <laughs> I, it's so funny you said that because back when I was at Nationwide at some coworkers and I, we did that. We looked at all the different roles within the industry and we compared them to high school cliques. So because we were on the carrier <laughs> side, we looked at all the sales and marketing reps. They were the jocks and the cheerleaders and the popular kids. You know, okay. the, the actuarials, the actuary and product people, those were like the AV the club mathletes. and the mathletes. Yes. <laughs> That that sing raps about Kevin. What's Kevin Napore? Kevin Napore, the man. Yeah. So, so there are actuaries in the insurance industry. Yeah. Oh my God. Mm-hmm. So that's really funny. Which is really funny because we actually have an episode back in che- in, in season one called Cheerleaders Produced, and mm-hmm. and that guest Wes Dyson is quite literally a producer and was a cheerleader. So it was you know yeah it kind of fit. Yeah. So that's fun. So um. You know, you kind of started going down the road, I think, uh, that you and I, our brains are slightly similar, but largely dissimilar. And there's a reason for it. You have, what did you call it? A diverse cognitive ability. Mm -hmm. Which is. So I have um, ADHD. And so it's one of those things that, I mean, people throw around ADHD and ADD so casually and they're like, oh, I've got ADHD. I know. but 
Kickle, kickle. Yeah. And <laughs> <laughs> it's actually one of those things that I wasn't diagnosed with um, until my late 30s. And ADHD, especially in girls, is often underdiagnosed because it manifests itself differently in girls than it does in boys. And, you know, you always think of it as more of just a study thing, a focus thing. But after I got diagnosed, the, the therapist was saying, well, this is probably how your life looked. And I'm going, oh, my gosh, I feel so seen because some of the habits, uh, some of the ways that it manifested itself in me throughout the years was uh, extreme shyness, really conflict averse. And I can understand that conflict avoidance because for me, the way that my ADHD, I think, really slows me down, so to speak is it's very easy for me to get overwhelmed with so much information coming at me because I do want to take it all in, but I only have so much bandwidth. So I always think, wait, just streamline it. Tell me what I need to know, because if you give me too much extra information, I'm not going to know what to do with this. Yeah. And it's interesting. So as a kid, my parents had me tested because they they knew something was different about me. Right. Uh, I learned how to read when I was three years old. But, wow. But none of my family knew who taught me. It was this joke, like, who taught her how to read? And at first, I remember a teacher thinking, oh, you just must have memorized those words because someone else read it to you. But I could pick right. up another book that I'd never picked up before and read it out loud. But the thing is, is I wouldn't talk to people. So the only way people would ever hear my voice was when I was reading something. Mm. So I never made eye contact, painfully shy, really did not like loud noises. I still don't like loud noises. So I did have something called hyperlexia. And what hyperlexia is, it's just what it sounds like. It's kind of the opposite of dyslexia. It is an unusually advanced ability to read. But the thing is, is I can read the words, I don't necessarily understand the paragraph that I just read. So it's just because mm -hmm. a kid can read really quickly, it doesn't necessarily equate to comprehension. Right. And so that's why I was going to ask. So like comprehensive skills, which kind of ties into your to the ADHD mm -hmm. and, and losing focus with stuff like you can read what's going on around you, but you might be focusing on the bird that you hear chirping. Right. Or, well, and what happens is, is I'm looking for so many context clues. So for instance, if you take, and I'm just pulling these words off the top of my head right now, the word primate and the word primitive. Okay. They both look the same when you look at it. And so if I see that word in context with the surrounding words, I understand what word that I read. But so much of what I'm comprehending is based on the context of the paragraph. Mm -hmm. So it's one of the reasons why, like, I can read technical stuff. That's why I love insurance contracts. Right. But you you give me Shakespeare or some poetry with lots of imagery that I've got to interpret. Uh-uh. I might like the way it sounds, but I have no idea what it means. Yeah. <laughs> so because it's just way too off. And what's frustrating about you know, being this kid that can read at such an early age is you, people set you up to think, oh my gosh, you're gifted, you're a genius. Well, then everybody else catches up to you. So <laughs> your parents set the stage that you're going to be this great genius because you're so advanced. Well, wasn't I a disappointment to my mother? <laughs> oh my goodness. No, you know, that's a great, uh, just as you were saying that, that's a great little message there though. And I think throughout life is that you know, oftentimes people compare themselves to other people and they think, oh, they've got it together. They, you know, they're mm -hmm. so much far ahead of me, even though we're the same age or, you know, just even me and my brother, even he's three years older than me. And in terms of, if you will, settling down in life and, you know, getting your ducks mm -hmm. in a row, quack, quack, we weren't on the same level. He was behind me. It took right. him years to find out what he wanted to do with his life and everything. But even still in school, one of the things that I had when my daughter was in kindergarten, preschool, pre-K, whatever, could not recognize a letter, even at pre-K four. Mm -hmm. like, oh, we think we're going to have to hold her back. I'm like, ah, she's just a baby. You don't need to recognize yeah. letters. She'll well, get it. She'll catch up. And that's the thing is you might have been advanced for reading 
and those stereotypes that come with it. That was another thing that mm-hmm. you had mentioned earlier, uh, but only it was hindsight. You said you were sitting down with a doctor and they were saying what your life must have looked like. Like you, you might have mm-hmm. been attentive or you know, shy or nonverbal right. or whatever. But a lot of times for parents, when they're sitting down with their kids at the doctor's table early on, they're saying, this is what your child's life is going to look like. They start mm-hmm. assigning these stereotypes. Yeah. And that's dangerous, you know, to like assign these stereotypes and these expectations. Yeah. But I I think the understanding is so important. And especially these days, we have a better understanding. You and I can read the same paragraph, but the way that our brains are processing information are so different. And we just as you and I have had different educational paths to get this to the same table, our brains have different neural paths to get to the same conclusions. Yeah. And it's really fascinating, something that, you know, I, I work on a lot with my husband, because now that I'm medicated for ADHD, I'm much better at dealing with conflict now than I ever (laughs) was before. Because I think my ADHD made it so, it made me so conflict averse, because it's just overwhelming. When you've got all of these little details to go through, my reaction is information overload. I'm shutting it down and I'm ignoring it all. (laughs) So, yeah. But now I, after having gotten the right medication for it, I have the tools to be able to sit down and understand how my brain is processing the information and what I need to work around it. But it's interesting, last week, so I ran out of my medication and the pharmacy didn't have it ready. So I had to go two days last week without having my ADHD medication. And man, did I feel it because, you know, I'm trying to work on, uh, I was, I was looking at exam, doing an exam review and I really recognized my hyperlexia because I was reading words, but then I would stop and go, well, what the heck did I just read? Like, I, you know, I, it wasn't solidifying in my brain as a thought. Um, but I've learned over the years how to structure my work day in a way that allows me to be productive. But I also recognize some of the things that can really throw my productivity off. And about two years ago, uh, I was also having lots of anxiety and just, you know, I could not get my ADHD under control. Oh, gosh. And it, you know, working with, with a therapist for a while, it turned out I was also diagnosed with PTSD. And so having that PTSD kind of helps me understand the triggers that will make my attention even worse, because a lot of it is based on just, you know, my my blood pressure and and the, the stuff going on in my head. But one thing that I I can tell that that's going to throw me off. And again, I can't speak to all people with ADHD. I can speak to my experience and um I did learn there are three types of ADHD. So there's the ADHD type inattentive, which are the daydreamers. Right. They're not the ones that manifest themselves as totally hyper and spastic. And a lot of girls tend to fall into that. So that's why yeah. they often don't get diagnosed as easily. There's ADHD type impulsive, which is that more typical, you know, squirrel, something shiny. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And then there's, there's that combination. Mm -hmm. So I can get into a zone where I'm focused on something. So let's say for instance, one of the the projects that I'm working on now is updating the CISR course for both insuring property and for commercial casualty one. So let's say there was a day last week, I'm working on one of the uh, insuring property chapters. And I'm in a zone, I'm productive, things are going as needed. Well, commercial casualty one is something that we are, you know, trying to get wrapped up so it can uh, be ready to be delivered very soon. So I get uh, messages from our instructional designers and our quality analysts saying, hey, can you double check this? And because it's time sensitive, I can easily pivot and go, okay, let me drop this and focus on this. But it's really hard for me to code switch back. So then once I finished that task for commercial casualty, 
I can't just jump back in into entering property. So making that code switch is really challenging. So I find that I have to be very deliberate with my day. Like I structure my day in such a way where I say, okay, from 10 o'clock to 1130, I'm going to work on this. And if I have meetings, I really try to avoid having back-to-back meetings because again, making that mental code switch from one topic to another is really challenging and very overwhelming. Oh my gosh, I'm the same. Yeah, no, it's hard. Like if I've got a day that has some meetings in there and I am focused on one course or needing to answer somebody's questions or whatever, and then here comes a meeting, like a lot of times the rest of my productivity for the rest of the day is shot. So I, yeah, it's hot. It is, you're right. It is hard to get back into it. Sometimes I'll have to get up and go to the kitchen and be like, all right, when I'm done drinking this water, Mm -hmm. done eating this snack, I'm going to sit back down and I'm going to focus. And you've got to, you know, make your little dot on team. Yeah. And you know, every, it is, it is hard to switch back and forth. And I'm the type of person even that, you know, somebody will be like, Hey, you got five minutes. I'm like, yeah, sure. What's up? And then, of course, it turns oh. into a lot longer than five minutes. But whatever they bring up in that, do you got five minutes? I mm-hmm. hope it right then. And it, I need to get mm-hmm. it done right then. Chances are I'm going yeah. to do it later. But then I forgot what I was doing before they said, hey, you got five minutes. So <laughs> Yeah. And that's something, I mean, FYI to, to anybody on our team, if you're going to do the <laughs> you got five minutes, please make it be something really important. Because like you said, I can focus on it but it's going to mess up my productivity for the rest of the day because I'm guilty of the, Hey, you got five minutes and I, I turn it into like, yeah. So, so (laughs) I'm best, you know, what's best for me. Like if you need me for something that day, just send me the calendar invite, even if it's just for later in the afternoon, because that allows my brain to go, okay, at two 30, I'm going to talk to Dustin about this and I can give it my focus, but yeah, it's otherwise it gets, I, I get, super stressed out. And, and I've also recognized the times of day that I'm more productive and whatnot. But so if something deviates from my routine and my schedule, the anxiety gets really high. It, so it, it really helps for me to know what to expect throughout my day. What time of day do you find your most productive? In the mornings. And me? So, mm-hmm. okay. For, okay. I'll, I'll let you answer the next question before I answer it myself. Why? Why in the mornings? Because I think I haven't had a chance for all the other distractions of the day to get into my head. You wake up in the morning, you're a clean slate, you know, I'm going to do X and Y and Z and all of that's great. Yeah. Then throughout the day, real life says, ha ha, you fool, uh, <laughs> you got that wrong. Oh and my God, right. all this other noise and detritus enters your head and it's so much more to sift through. Right. So that's followed me from the agency over here to the National Alliance. I remember, so I used to be, I still am. I say I'm not anymore, but I know I still am. I used to be a planner. Like I went into my work week, there was going into your work week and then there was going into your work day. But I went into my work week going, okay, I've got this many remarkets I'm going to do, not knowing who they were, or maybe I did Mm -hmm. because I had, you know, my renewal list and everything. I'm going to get this done. I'm going to close out all these activities. So we were, when I was in an agency, instead of saying like you had 70 activities or whatever, you know how you can scroll from one page to the next and there's Mm -hmm. maybe like 20 or so items listed on one page. So we went by pages is, is how my brain processed it anyways. And I'd be like, oh, I've got three pages of activities that I've got to do. I'm going to get it down to a page and pack. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to get it down to 70 or, you know, whatever. I'm going to get it down to a page and a half. And it was, mm-hmm. it was really interesting as I was wrapping up my time at the agency to come to the National Alliance to only see one or two activities on my screen instead mm-hmm. of pages, because, you know, obviously I wasn't going to be there the next week to to clean those. It was really surreal. I'm like, how did I not do this before? Like, how did I keep my pages or my activities at two or three pages instead of only having one or two to do? So, you know, sidetrack on that thought there is you can Mm -hmm. catch up if you want to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) You might keep distracting yourself and can't catch up. But I would go into the work week with like, I'm going to do this, this, and this, and this. And by the end of that work week, I was like, uh, you didn't get none of that done. Yes. <laughs> well, and you know, it's funny. It's like, so one of the things as we're working on uh, revising some of these CISR courses, you know, we've got a great team of instructional designers and quality analysts and, you know, so many other people to look at those details. And again, I'm 
not rec- like if 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 I got to focus on what I want to like what do I want this book to say and I can get that out but you know the little nuances the numbering the formatting I'm not looking at that <laughs> I'm just trying to get the thoughts out that stuff distracts me yeah. because I need it yeah that's one thing that I'm like I need the bullets to be right where they need mm-hmm. to be I need the formatting to look right mm-hmm. And, you know, if you start to write something and it shifts to the left. Oh, I hate that. Like, yes. I got to move it back. And then the whole daggum document reformats itself and it knocks you off. Yeah. But I like does. I just want to make a shout out. I'm, I've am i been working with uh, Christina and Becky and we've got a new uh, instructional designer, Emily. I just I just want to give them a shout out. Lifesaver. Like, all those little details that they catch because I'm just not seeing it. Now, it, yeah. when they're well, yeah, it's hard to see your own right stuff in your own work. Yeah, when you're, you know, and even if you you're done and you stop and you try to shift mm-hmm. your mindset and you go back to look at the mistakes or the way something's worded, you're still reading it in your own right. Brain. And so it's making sense in your brain, but what's on the paper is not exactly what you're reading. Exactly. <laughs> so that's why when it when it comes back to me for the final QA and sign off. Then I kind of know, okay, if this is the final one, I'm putting my do not disturb on. I'm got to switch my brain to read it as though somebody else put this together. But like that is a poor, like I have to make that cognitive effort and schedule that time and say, I'm going to put my brain in third party mode right now. So if someone right. has a question for me that's going to make me go back into first party mode, it's going to throw me off. <laughs> so. Structuring my day is super important because that way I can kind of make sure that my brain is working the way that it needs to work. Because it's it's really frustrating. Structure your day, but don't beat yourself up if you get off track and get onto something else. Because yeah, that something else and, might actually be. And, and you know, yeah, one of the terms that, that I've learned, so. you know, after getting diagnosed with ADHD, is the term executive dysfunction. And oh yes, my goodness, yeah, too. there because again, that day that I couldn't have my medication, it, it's so frustrating because I w- I'm saying, and, and it starts this cycle of shame because I'm like, oh, I'm a smart person. Why can't I get this done? And then you start hating on yourself and everything and getting that, that spiral is so dangerous. And uh, so I think it's, that's one of the reasons why I'm so glad that we're kind of doing this series. Uh, wanting to talk to people with with different diverse processes in their head because i think it's okay to to normalize it and let people know like there's nobody that's truly neurotypical no. we're all processing things a different way <laughs> right right so there's there's a, a good term out there called neurotypical or atypical and God, it's just kind of like i don't know if you remember when you were growing up how people would go oh you're not normal and everybody the thing to say then was yeah what is normal anyways you know what is none of us are normal we're all you know our own individuals so it's you know i love that we're having these conversations i love that we're focusing on these and you know one of the reasons why we did want to focus on this is because we both mm-hmm. love the insurance industry i mean it's like weird when people are like, oh, I love something that's super nerdy, but we love it for so mm-hmm. many different reasons because it can fit so many different personalities and you can meet, uh, meet so many different people and you can yes. thrive. You know, one of the hardest things as a parent is you just, you, you're you concerned all the time. Like, where is your kid going to fit in when they're an adult? Like, where are they going to thrive? Because and it's a miracle that I've found an industry <laughs> where I thrive. <laughs> I think about all the ways my adult life could have gone wrong Mm -hmm. and the insurance industry was my saving grace, right? Mm -hmm. So no, these, these real conversations, and I think they're happening a lot more, you know, especially from the last year or so, as people had to sit and be with themselves, not a lot of people were used to being with themselves and themselves only. So you end up discovering more about yourself. Oh, yeah. You know, that was, that was actually something that came up and my middle child is, heavily involved in therapy Mm -hmm. for several different reasons. But that was one of the things that came up in her session was like, you're never going to be comfortable Mm -hmm. with other people until you're comfortable with yourself. Yeah. Maybe that's why I'm not comfortable with other people because I'm still learning (laughs) how to be comfortable with myself. I was sitting in there and I felt like she was talking to me. Like I (laughs) honed in on something on the wall. Like, oh my God, this is what's wrong with me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) I'm not comfortable with other people because I'm not comfortable with myself. Mm -hmm. 
So in case anybody's wondering, uh, you just brought up executive dysfunction. Executive functioning is a thing here in our house. And we, uh, you know, it, it has to do with the way your brain develops when you're a child, about whether or not you can process things a different way. So it's, you know, it's emotional control and how you respond to things that go around you. It's even making decisions, whether or not you're capable of making decisions quickly or the right decisions, you know. It, um, so a lot of people will make fun of themselves and say that their brain to mouth filter is mm-hmm. is broken. Mine is heavily broken. That's an executive function. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Being able to organize your thoughts before they come out of your mouth yeah. is an executive function. So Well, and I think when you look at executive functioning too, we all have a limited amount of bandwidth. Yes. You know, that we can do. Uh, I, I say I only have a, li- a limited amount of Fs to give per day. <laughs> So, um, you know, I don't actually usually say Fs. Uh, I may be a little bit more colorful with that. But I'm going to plead the fifth on that one. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) You look at people like Steve Jobs and Mark Zuckerberg, and these are geniuses that wear the same outfit every day because, you know, their thought process is you have when you have to make so many decisions throughout the day, you need to be selective on what you're going to spend that mental energy on. So best to weed out those things that don't matter. You know, you you have to be very deliberate about what you choose to give an F about. So, <laughs> I mean, and so whether it be with work or personal, regardless, I have the same number, I have a limited number of Fs to give when I wake up in the morning. And so are those going to be given at work? Or are those going to be given, you know, right. in, in my home life? And so when... For instance, when uh, Becky or Christina comes back to me uh, when working on a draft and they say, well, can we reword this or can we change the name on this or how do we conform about this? I, I want to say I'm like, you decide. I, I don't want to get caught up in that because if I spend too much time worrying on this little detail, I'd much rather let the people that are good at details worry about it. And yeah, so I try to just stay in my in my lane. <laughs> right. So how do you think being in the industry and in the insurance industry has worked with your ADHD for you to become successful? Because you are, you're successful. Not only are you successful, but you're a woman in insurance. That's a big thing too. So how, and you've had this, what'd you call it? Cognitive, I'm going to struggle with this for the next <laughs> couple of episodes. Uh, diverse cognitive, but you have this diverse cognitive ability. And mm-hmm. so, you know, one thing I tell my kids, I keep going back to my kids, mom life, right? So one thing I tell my kids is I I tell them, you can take what you're given, whether it's good or bad, and you can decide to dwell in it and which is going to destroy you and you're not going to have a very good path because you're not moving forward. Or you can take it and and make something out of it. No matter what you're given, whether you think it's good or bad, there is always something to come out of it. So you're given ADHD, um, Mm -hmm. what did you say? The inattentive type, which can be difficult Mm -hmm. to deal with. How has the how has being in the industry, the insurance industry, given you the flexibility to be successful and be yourself at the same time? So, I mean, so when I started out, I spent a majority of my career in underwriting, and and then I was I I, I loved underwriting. I thought it was great, and underwriting commercial was really nice because I got to really look into all different types of industries and businesses, and and I like to think that I was a very thorough underwriter. Because if, if I got a risk that was really interesting, I was researching everything that I could about it. You know, because it's I, one of the things that I love about insurance in general is there's so much to learn. And I love, I Me love too. getting more information. I yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's been really great. And then, you know, I was also able, I, I spent a number of years uh, out in the field, um, both as a field underwriter and doing training and having that different focus every day, but yet still very structured. So I could be in a different office every day, which was great. You know, I'm physically moving. And and I know people that are listening right now, they can't see me, but I do think better when I'm physically her hands are my hands are let me go ahead and describe it. (laughs) But she has a very handsy speaker. Yes. So for when I was doing agency training, it was great because I would stand up in front of a classroom and I could explain things very visually. 
and so yeah kind of just understanding what worked for me but i again what was really great about being in a training arena was i knew okay this day these are the things that i'm going to focus on and so i could start each day very deliberate about what it what my day was going to look like i really don't think i could do well in a producer role. Why do you think you wouldn't thrive as a producer? Um, I'm going to play devil's advocate, by the way. Oh, yeah, that's good. And and you you might have some producers that are call in and say, no, you're completely mis- mistaken about that. I know. See, this is the role I like to play. I like I like for people to tell me what they think they can't do and then to be able to go, but you can. Yeah, <laughs> I don't like knowing that I'm going to have to deal with the unexpected. Like, I don't like not having any idea as to how something's going to go. Like as to whether so, or not somebody's going to accept your proposal or what do you mean? Or e- yeah, or even what a meeting is going to look like, okay. you know, especially when you're in a sales role, there's a lot of those kind of like, there's a lot of that networking, getting to know you stuff. And oh, I know I need an agenda. You ever role played? I have. Yeah. I mean, like professionally yes. <laughs> role played. Let's not take this to the wrong area of our lives here. Professionally role playing. Mm-hmm. So there, in, in account managing, this isn't producing, but in account managing, you do have a level of producing that you do in house, right? Mm-hmm. But some of the most difficult times come up when you either need to tell somebody that a claim isn't going to be covered, or the reason why that claim isn't covered, or they've called in and asked you a question and you don't have, or you have a solution, but it's you know a really expensive solution or whatever. So a lot of times, I had some really difficult clients. I had one client. Uh, like his name got triggered this past Ooh. weekend and I'm not going to say the name, but his name got triggered this past weekend. And anyways, it was one of those that would say, do you know who I am? Oh. Do you know where I work? Ugh. Do you know? And I'm just like, yes, I do. Or I wouldn't be calling you right yeah. now. Do you know who I am? I'm your insurance agent. Do you know where I work? It's, <laughs> at, it's at this agency and I handle your coverage. So are you ready to talk to me now or not? Um, but no, I would sit down with a colleague. And literally, I'm a I'm a map it out kind of person. Mm-hmm. But she would play that person, or she would play me, either one. If I felt like I had his personality on lockdown a lot better than she did, and she would start the conversation, or I would, and we would start writing down answers, and we would draw it, you know, mm-hmm. this answer to that answer. Try to think. And I would do the same thing if I needed to have a difficult conversation with my boss. Yeah, like we would sit down and we would map out how this conversation is going to go. Now you can't catch every possibility, right? But you can catch most of them and feel more confident going into the situation that if one of these scenarios that you've practiced comes up, you've got it. You can handle it. And I definitely understand that because trust me, as an underwriter. I've had to initiate lots of uncomfortable <laughs> conversations. <laughs> <laughs> right. So that's what you can do as a producer, though. You just got to map out your conversation and which way it's going to go. So what's another yeah. reason why you feel like your personality couldn't be in a producer role? So I, I feel like as a producer there, and, and again, I can be completely off on this. For me, I'm not motivated by quotas. I'm not motivated by having sales numbers. I mean, they're great. And I understand those metrics are important, but that is not something that motivates me at all. My joy, I guess, comes from helping somebody understand something. My joy comes from being more in that support role. So maybe I'd be better as an account manager than a producer. And 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 that's also one of the reasons why I love training so much. I mean, yeah, and we do have metrics and things that we got to look at, but Really where that satisfaction comes is is helping and coaching somebody from point A to point B. Right. Now, I see producers definitely need to stay high level in things mm-hmm. because they're about driving in the business and meeting the quotas, as, as, as you said. But, you know, that's like that's the type of producer that you want to be because it takes yeah. all kinds to make the world go round. Yeah. And there are some I, really niche producers out there that there say, are. like, I want to focus on this because it's really important to me. Maybe they've had an experience in the past in their life that was either health related or, I don't know, farming related or a uh, mechanic. Maybe their dad was a mechanic and they want to focus on small auto shops or whatever. And they go in and instead of driving in, you know, in terms of quotas, yeah, they go in driving the relationship. You yeah, could be a producer. You could. I think. <laughs> I, I think a lot of a lot of the really successful producers I know they have a. I don't know if competitive is the right word for it, 
But that they do. Dri- yeah, there's there's a drive to win. There's a bit of that competitive streak. And I'm I've never had that competitive streak myself. Like I just I'm not. I'm I'm totally good saying, all right, you got this. I, I'm not I mean, I'm competitive against myself. Right. Like I might set a goal, you know, let's say if I'm running or something, I might set a goal for myself to beat who I was a month ago, but I just I just don't have that. Right. Yeah, no, I'm highly competitive with myself. Yeah. I can get really competitive with producers too when they come in and tell me mm-hmm. they want to write something and they're like, and I'm like, no, that's not going to fit with a carrier. And they're going to go, well, we've got a loophole. And I'm going to go, well, I'm not going to write it under that loophole. And we'll just go back and mm-hmm. forth. And be like, I'm going to win this no matter what. So just go ahead and yeah. walk out of my office now. <laughs> yeah, I've never been diagnosed with it, so I'm not going to tease about it. But oppositional defiance disorder is a thing uh, in our mm-hmm. in our household as well and and i feel it every day though i feel like if we would have known about this diagnosis as a kid i probably would have been diagnosed with it Mm -hmm. because if somebody tells me to do something i don't want to do it yeah like even if it's a good idea yeah even if like if somebody's just like if my husband comes in and says you're going to Mm -hmm. you know fill in the blank i'm like no i'm not Mm -hmm. (laughs) the very first thought that comes into my head like you can't make me do yeah. That. Oh, yeah. I, I don't think I would have survived my childhood if I had that. My mother would have just, I mean, beaten me. <laughs> I, know, I know we can't joke about these things, but I mean, she's not, no, she would have, she would have, yeah, I would not have survived that. But I do have where if you, so I don't like being constrained at all. So if you tell me to do something that I have to do something, okay, I'll do it. But once you tell me I can't do something, right. then I go, oh, really? Oh, watch really? me. Right, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me I can't watch this. See what I can do. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, these are great uh, conversational points. There's a couple of things that I brought out of it. You know, one of the things that I think really resonated with me is that like you started with you were really advanced in your reading skills. And your uh, physicians or whomever, uh, you know, set you up to say that you were going to be the super bright child. That's a high bar to reach, mm-hmm. even if it's true. Even if that's a stereotype of any type of uh, cognitive ability, Mm -hmm. that's a hard bar to reach when somebody says you're precocious or you're going to reach this level or you're going to be the best in your class. They'll be valedictorian one day. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's the same as giving kids or adults or anybody else a lower bar to set. Yeah. You're not going to make it very much. You're an astronaut, which is, you know, one thing that I've had to get my husband to stop saying like, Mm -hmm. you you should go into being an astronaut, meaning, mm. you, you know, you live in outer space. Kind yeah. Of thing. You know, when you set bars too low, then it, you know, it just kind of self-deprecates or whatever. But knowing that you were assigned this, this child is going to be an advanced reader, an advanced mm-hmm. learner or whatever. It's a good message to say, don't compare yourself to somebody else is what was going on in my head. Mm-hmm. Like here in our industry now, if you're a producer, it, you know, if you started at the same time with another producer or even came into um, a, an agency where there's high earning producers and you're not quite meeting it yet, you'll get there. Mm-hmm. You just got to stick with it. God, mm-hmm. I just had that conversation with my daughter this morning. She was asking me to braid her hair before first day of middle school. And I'm like, no, you've got a week until school starts. You're going to sit in front of a mirror and you're going to start. Pride. But I can't. Well, you're yeah. not going to if you keep saying I can't. So, yeah. And then I told her. You know, out of a hundred times, you can get it wrong ninety nine. Mm-hmm. But then that one time that you get it right, you'll finally be able to say you know how to do it. So keep trying, even if you think somebody is a higher. You're gonna catch up. Learn from them, see what they're doing, learn from their mistakes, whatever. And I think kind of in that same vein too, it's important to not dwell too much on what you were able or not able to do yesterday, mm. because it's always going to be a new day tomorrow Mm -hmm. um i don't know if you remember the show doogie hauser um Mm -hmm. yeah you may be set the doctor the really young doctor. yes neil patrick harris before he was in how i met your mother he was a young doctor and so the whole premise (laughs) of the show is he was like this genius doctor well and there's one episode where someone told him he's like well you're doogie hauser now you're this young genius kid now but one day you're just gonna be a smart guy yeah because you know, other people are going to catch up or, you're, you know, what what makes you special now is not necessarily going to be you can't rest on those laurels forever. <laughs> so, right. You yeah. know, just as you can't rest on those laurels forever, you can't rest on them mistakes forever either. Right. Or, or, or your awkwardness or man. the awkwardness. Yeah. You, I can't tell you how many times I go to bed all wrapped up in my head because I'm like, did I really say did I really? OK, 
And I, so I mm-hmm. go to bed thinking about those things and just all tied up in them. And I'm starting to, especially through this podcast, I'm starting to be like, all right, well, tomorrow's a different day. Yeah. Yeah. Tomorrow, you know, it's important just product, to understand, beyond. like, you and know, I- you do your little debrief of that situation that you play over and over again a million times and go, okay, what are my takeaways? What are the things that I can learn from this? Yeah. No, I mean, I get it. So that's fun. Well, Kat, I have surely enjoyed talking to you. I hope that our listeners um, are picking up on your personality and just how much fun it's going to be to have you as a co-host this season. I do you Amazon. <laughs> oh, do I Amazon? You should see my recycling bin right now. Uh, <laughs> so, okay. we yeah, School is starting back. So mm-hmm. I've been doing a lot of Amazon shopping and we'll get boxes and my husband will go, well, what's in that one? I'm like, I don't know. Uh, yeah. Same with me. You're the, <laughs> you're the one that was doing the shopping. So I, I told him yesterday, I was like, I, I honestly actively forget what I ordered. Mm-hmm. Just so I'm surprised when the next yes. box comes in. What's the last thing you ordered on Amazon? Oh, let's see. Um, it was probably some junk that I didn't need. Uh, well, so I I do a lot of Amazon subscriptions. So the last Amazon box that came was like a subscription, just some dog stuff. Aren't those fun? They are like, fun. But it's I, like giving yourself a present it, every other month it or so. It is. But no, the last thing I got, so I have a little cruiser bike. You know, it's a little beach cruiser. It's yellow. It's got a white whisk, wicker basket in front. So I got some lights for my bike. Aww. Yeah. And I'm a, my bike is just, I look like a total hipster girl. And so I'm going to put like yellow flowers in it and just, yeah, it's cute. <laughs> All right. Well, I can't wait to have more episodes with you. This is going to be a really fun season coming up. Any parting words, last final ideas? I think so too. Well, fail on the idea totally. Well, no. And I, you know, one of the things I'd really ask listeners to just be open-minded if, if there is something that if, if they have a diverse cognitive ability that, uh, they've had to learn how to work with to make them successful in their careers. I would love to hear about that. Right. I, yes. I, I think there is so much power in sharing the sharing our struggles with each other. Yeah. Um, because and that's what this podcast really wants to be is just a way to connect with what's real and what we're doing. Yeah. And and as you said, we do have an audience of younger listeners, whether they be in the high school CISR program or they be in a university program. But so if, if you're a listener out there and you think that you've got some some guidance that you want to share to the next generation of insurance professionals, let us know. We'd really love to hear that. Yes. Yeah, send us an email. Again, I think we said it at the beginning, but podcast at SCIC.com. It's truly been fun and absolutely amazing. Kat, thank you so much. Thanks, Dustin. Toodles. Toodles. <laughs> Thanks for hanging around and listening to another Awkward Conversation in Insurance. Stay tuned for new episodes from Awkward Insurance wherever you listen to your podcasts. And be sure to check out the National Alliance on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, or at scic.com. Now go forth and be awkward. Toodles!